Today is the 26th of August, uh, 2010, and this is the 38th time we are talking on the Majima Nikaya Suttas. Uh, and now we come to Sutta 93, Asalayana Sutta, to Asalayana. Thus have I heard, uh, one minute, uh, this, uh, the next following suttas, uh, the, the, the few following suttas are all concerned the Brahmins. Uh, it's quite interesting, uh, the, the sutta show uh, at the time of the Buddha, how these uh, Brahmins uh, always try to assert their superiority uh, and try to argue with the Buddha. Uh, Okay, thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's Park. Now at that time, 500 Brahmins from diverse provinces were staying at Savati for some business or other. Then those Brahmins thought, this recluse Gotama describes purification for all the four castes. Who is there able to dispute with him about this assertion? Stop here for a moment. Uh, these Brahmins, uh, they claim uh, that only they are pure. Uh, all the other castes, uh, the other three castes, uh, are impure. Uh. Also, they claim uh, that uh, every morning before dawn and in the evening after dusk, uh, they go and immerse themselves in the river and they can purify themselves uh, by, the, by washing away their sins. Uh, but they say all other castes uh, cannot do that. Uh, uh. But so when they heard that the Buddha says uh, all the four castes uh, can be purified, uh, they were not happy. Uh, so they were trying to think of somebody to go and argue with him. Now on that occasion, a Brahmin student named Asalayana was staying at Savati, young, shaven-headed, 16 years old. He was a master of the three Vedas with their vocabularies, liturgy, phonology and etymology, and the histories as a fifth, skilled in philology and grammar. He was fully versed in natural philosophy and in the marks of a great man. Then the Brahmins thought, there is this young Brahmin student named Asalayana staying at Savati young, shaven-headed, uh, 16 years old, etc., uh, and fully versed in natural philosophy, philosophy and the marks of a great man. He will be able to dispute with the recluse Gotama about this assertion. So the Brahmins went to the Brahmin student, Asalayana, and said to him, Master Asalayana, this recluse Gotama describes purification for all the four castes. Let Master Asalayana come <coughs> and dispute with the recluse Gotama about this assertion. When this was said, the Brahmin student Asalayana replied, Sirs, the recluse Gotama is one who speaks the Dhamma. Now those who speak the Dhamma are difficult to dispute with. I am not able to dispute with the recluse Gotama about this assertion. The second time, the Brahmin said to him, Master Asalayana, this recluse Gotama describes purification for all the four castes. Let Master Asalayana come and dispute with the recluse Gotama about this assertion. For the training of a wanderer has been completed by Master Asalayana. For the second time, the Brahmin student Asalayana replied, Sirs, the recluse Gotama is one who speaks the Dhamma. Now, those who speak the Dhamma are difficult to dispute with. I am not able <coughs> to dispute with the recluse Gotama about this assertion. A third time, the Brahmin said to him, Master Asalayana, this recluse Gotama describes purification for all the four castes. Let Master Asalayana come and dispute with the recluse Gotama about this assertion. For the training of a wanderer has been completed by Master Asalayana. Let not the Master Asalayana be defeated without having even fought the battle. When this was said, the Brahmin student Asalayana replied, Sirs, 
The recluse Gautama is one who speaks the Dhamma. Now those who speak the Dhamma are difficult to dispute with. I am not able to dispute with the recluse Gautama about this assertion. Still, sirs, at your bidding, I will go. Uh, stop here for a moment. So, this Asalayana, he heard of the reputation of the Buddha, so he dare not go to uh, debate with the Buddha. Lah. But since they persuaded him three times, uh, he felt he had no choice, lah. so he was willing to go. Then the Brahmin student, Asalayana, went with a great number of Brahmins to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and said to the Blessed One, I'll stop here for a moment. You see, yeah, they only exchange greetings with the Buddha. They never pay respect to the Buddha. <coughs> so he said to the Blessed One, Master Gautama, the Brahmins say thus, Brahmins are the highest caste. Those of any other caste are inferior. Brahmins are the fairest caste. Those of any other caste are dark. Only Brahmins are purified, not non-Brahmins. Brahmins alone are the sons of Brahma, the offspring of Brahma, born of his mouth, born of Brahma, created by Brahma, heirs of Brahma, what does Master Gautama say about that? I'll stop here for a moment. So this is their belief, Brahmins, that they are born from the great Deva, Brahma or Maha Brahma, who resides in the first jhana plane, the lowest of the form realm. So they claim they are born from the mouth of this Brahma. And the Buddha said, Now Asalayana, the Brahmin women are seen having their periods, becoming pregnant, giving birth, and giving suck. And yet those who are born from the wombs of the Brahmin women say thus, Brahmins are the highest caste. Those of any other caste are inferior. <clears throat> Brahmins are the fairest caste. Those of any other caste are dark. Only Brahmins are purified, not non-Brahmins. Brahmins alone are the sons of Brahma, offspring of Brahma, born of his mouth, born of Brahma, created by Brahma, heirs of Brahma. Stop here for a moment. Huh? So the Buddha says, huh, it is evi evident, huh? everybody can see huh, that women, Brahmin women, huh, they become pregnant and give birth to their babies huh, and give suck to their babies. Huh? And yet, all of you, huh, even though you are born from the Brahmin womb, huh, you say you are born from Brahma's uh, mouth. Huh? And he said, although Master Gautama says this, still the Brahmins think thus, Brahmins are the highest caste. Those of any other caste are inferior, etc., etc. And the Buddha uh, replied, What do you think, Asalayana? Have you heard that in Yona and Cambodia and in other outland countries there are only two castes, masters and slaves, and that masters become slaves and slaves masters? So I have heard, sir. Then on the strength of what argument or with the support of what authority do the Brahmins in this case say that Brahmins are the highest caste, others, uh, those of any other caste are inferior, etc. Mm, stop here for a moment. So the Buddha says uh, uh, in other countries, uh, they have only two caste systems, uh, masters and slaves. Uh, and masters can become slaves and slaves can become masters. Uh, so those uh, masters are uh, in those lands, uh, they are the superior uh, caste. Lah. So if, even if Brahmins go there, yeah, they are not superior. Uh, <clears throat> Although Master Gautama says this, still the Brahmins think thus, Brahmins are the highest caste, those of any other caste are inferior, etc. What do you think, Asalayana? Suppose a noble, uh, somebody of the noble clan, uh, were to kill living beings, take what is not given, misconduct himself in sensual pleasures, speak falsely, speak maliciously, speak harshly, gossip, be covetous, have a mind of ill will and hold wrong view. On the dissolution of the body after death, would only he be likely to reappear in a state of deprivation, 
in an unhappy destination in perdition, even in hell, and not a Brahmin. Suppose a merchant or a worker who were to kill living beings, etc., and who wrong view on the dissolution of the body after death, would only he be likely to reappear in a state of deprivation, in an unhappy destination, in perdition, even in hell, and not a Brahmin? No, Master Gotama, whether it be a noble, or a Brahmin, or a merchant, or a worker, those of all four castes who kill living beings, take what is not given, misconduct themselves in sensual pleasures, speak falsely, etc. On the dissolution of the body after death, are likely to reappear in a state of deprivation, in an unhappy destination, in perdition, even in hell. And the Buddha said, Then on the strength of what argument or with the support of what authority do the Brahmins in this case say thus, Brahmins are the highest caste, those of any other caste are inferior, etc. I'll stop here for a moment. So here the Buddha shows him, uh, uh, if anybody uh, uh, breaks, uh, uh, misconducts himself uh, by... Uh, uh, doing the uh, ten unwholesome karmas, huh? uh, then uh, uh, they are bound for a uh, rebirth in a woeful destination. It doesn't matter whether they are nobles or brahmins or merchants or workers. Uh, so in which case uh, they are all the same. Uh. Although Master Gotama says this, still the Brahmins think thus, Brahmins are the highest caste, those of any other caste are inferior, etc., etc. What do you think, Asalayana? Suppose a Brahmin were to abstain from killing living beings, from taking what is not given, from misconduct in sensual pleasures, from false speech, from malicious speech, from harsh speech, and from gossip, and were to be uncovetous, to have a mind without ill will, and to hold right view. On the dissolution of the body after death, would only he be likely to reappear in a happy destination, even in the heavenly world, and not a noble, or a merchant, or a worker? No, Master Gotama, whether it be a noble, or a Brahmin, or a merchant, or a worker, those of all four castes who abstain <coughs> from killing living beings, from taking what is not given, from misconduct in sensual pleasures, etc., on the dissolution of the body after death, are likely to reappear in a happy destination, even in the heavenly world. Then on the strength of what argument or with the support of what authority do the Brahmins in this case say thus, Brahmins are the highest caste, those of any other caste are inferior, etc. Although Master Gotama says this, still the Brahmins think thus, Brahmins are the highest caste, those of any other caste are inferior, etc. What do you think, Asalayana? Is only a Brahmin capable of developing a mind of loving kindness towards a certain region, without hostility and without ill will, and not a noble, or a merchant, or a worker. No, Master Gotama, whether it be a noble, or a Brahmin, or a merchant, or a worker, those of all four castes are capable of developing a mind of loving kindness towards a certain region, without hostility and without ill will. Then on the strength of what argument, or with the support of what authority, do the Brahmins in this case say thus, Brahmins are the highest caste, those of any other caste are inferior, etc. Stop here for a moment. These Brahmins, they hope that after death, they will be reborn in the Brahma heavens, to have union with Brahma. So they like to practice these Brahma Viharas, this meditation, on the divine abidings, uh, where they radiate uh, loving four things: uh, loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. Uh, the Pali is metta, karuna, mudita, and upeka. Uh, so, uh, when they practice this meditation, uh, uh, then they can attain the the jhana, jhanas, and they can be reborn in the Brahma heaven. Uh. But here he conceded uh, that not only a Brahmin can practice this meditation, uh, any pers person of any other caste can also do so. Uh. Although Master Gotama says this, still the Brahmins think thus, 
Brahmins are the highest caste, those of any other caste are inferior, etc. What do you think, Asalayana? Is only a Brahmin capable of taking a lufa and bath powder, going to the, ri to the river and washing off dust and dirt, and not a noble or a merchant or a worker? No, Master Gotama, whether it be a noble or Brahmin or a merchant or a worker, those of all, of all four castes are capable of taking a lufa and bath powder, going to the river and washing off dust and dirt. Then on the strength of what argument or with the support of what authority do the Brahmins in this case say thus, Brahmins are the highest caste, etc. Uh, stop it for a moment. So here the Buddha shows him uh, that uh, any person of any caste uh, can go to the river and wash off the dust and dirt, uh, purify themselves, uh, at least externally, uh, not only Brahmins. Uh. Although Master Gotama says this, still the Brahmins think thus, Brahmins are the highest caste, those of any other caste are inferior, etc. So he keeps insisting uh, that Brahmins are the highest caste. What do you think, Asalayana? Suppose a head anointed noble king were to assemble here a hundred men of different birth and say to them, Come, sirs, let any here who have been born into a noble clan or a Brahmin clan or a royal clan take an upper fire stick of sala wood, salala wood, sandalwood and padumaka wood and light a fire and produce heat. And also let any who have been born into an outcast clan, a trapper clan, a wicker's worker's clan, a cartwright's clan, or a scavenger's clan, take an upper fire stick made from a dog's drinking trough, or from a pig's trough, from a dustbin, or from castor oil wood, and light a fire and produce heat. Uh -huh. What do you think, Asalayana? When a fire is lit and heat is produced by someone in the first group, would that fire have a flame, a color and a radiance? And would it be possible to use it for the purposes of fire? While when a fire is lit and heat is produced by someone in the second group, that fire would have no flame, no color and no radiance, and, would, and it would not be possible to use it for the purposes of fire. No, Master Gotama. When a fire is lit and produced by someone in the first group, that fire would have a flame, a color and a radiance, and it would be possible to use it for the purposes of fire. And when a fire is lit and, and heat is produced by someone of the second group, that fire too would have a flame, a color and a radiance, and it would be possible to use it for the purposes of fire. For all fire has a flame, a color and a radiance, and it is possible to use all fire for the purposes of fire. Then on the strength of what argument or with the support of what authority do the Brahmins in this case say thus, Brahmins are the highest caste, etc. I'll stop here for a moment. Nah. So here the Buddha says nah, there are two groups of people here. Nah. One is the higher clan, nah. that means either a noble or a Brahmin. Nah. And then if they were to light a fire from good wood, nah, sala wood or salala wood or sandal wood or padumaka wood, nah, and uh, a fire is produced. Nah. When you compare it nah, with the second group, nah, the second group consists of very low caste people, nah, uh, this trapper, uh, wicker worker, cartwright, scavenger, all these, uh, these uh, worker clan. Nah, uh, the Sudas la. and then even includes the outcast la. outcast is somebody so low uh, there is not even inside one of the four clans la. Uh, four castes la. Uh, and then this uh, second group uh, uh, being of low birth uh, uh, on top of that uh, they take wood uh, from uh, dirty places la, like a dog's drinking trough uh, and a pig's trough uh, where the, the, the dog drinks the water or the pig drinks the water uh, from the dustbin uh, uh, and castor oil wood uh, and if they were to produce a heat, uh, a fire uh, uh, using this uh, uh, dirty wood, uh, uh, this second group when they produce a fire, uh, the fire is still the same uh, whether it's uh, produced by this uh, higher clan or the lower clan, uh, the fire, the radiance, uh, the flame, the heat, 
uh, color everything uh, would still be the same. It doesn't matter what what wood you use, and it doesn't matter who uh, produces the fire. Uh, so the Buddha shows him, uh, uh, and they are all the same. Uh. Although Master Gotama says this, still the Brahmins think thus, Brahmins are the highest caste, those of any other caste are inferior, etc. What do you think, Asalayana? Suppose a noble youth were to cohabit with a Brahmin girl, and a son was born from their cohabitation. Should a son born from a noble youth and a Brahmin girl be called a noble after the father or a Brahmin after the mother? He could be called both Master Gotama. What do you think, Asalayana? Suppose a Brahmin youth here were to cohabit with a noble girl and a son were to be born from the cohabitation. Should the son born from a Brahmin youth and a noble girl be called a noble after the mother or a Brahmin after the father? He could be called both Master Gotama. What do you think, Asalayana? Suppose a mare were to be mated with a male donkey and a foal were to be born as the result. Should the foal be called a horse after the mother or a donkey after the father? It is a mule, Master Gotama, since it does not belong to either kind. I see the difference in this last case, but I see no difference in either of the former cases. What do you think, Asalayana? Suppose there were two Brahmin students who were brothers, born of the same mother, one studious and acute, and one neither studious nor acute. Which of them would Brahmins feed first at a funeral feast, or at a ceremonial milk rice offering, or at a sacrificial feast, or at a feast for guests? On such occasions, Brahmins would feed first the one who was studious and acute, Master Gotama, for how could what is given to one who is neither studious nor acute bring great fruit? Uh, stop here for a moment. Uh. So here, uh, uh, when you have two Brahmins, uh, one is very studious, uh, hard, diligent, uh, and also is very sharp, uh, intelligent, uh, uh, compared to another uh, who is not so diligent or intelligent, uh, then uh, uh, they would um, give preference. Uh, uh, to the one who was more studious and acute. Uh, what do you think, Asalayana? Suppose there were two Brahmin students who were brothers, born of the same mother, one studious and acute, but immoral and of bad character, and one neither studious nor acute, but virtuous and of good character. Which of them would Brahmins feed first at a funeral feast, or at a ceremonial milk rice offering, or at a sacrificial feast, or at a feast for guests? On such occasions, Brahmins would feed first the one who was neither studious nor acute, but virtuous and of good character, Master Gotama. For how could what is given to one who is immoral and of bad character bring great fruit? And the Buddha said, First, Asalayana, you took your stand on birth. And after that, you took your stand on scriptural learning. And after that, you have come to take your stand on the very ground that purification is for all castes as I describe it. When this was said, the Brahmin student Asalayana sat silent and dismayed, with shoulders drooping and head down, glum, and without response. Uh, stop here for a moment. Uh. So, at first, this Asalayana, he says uh, that a person is superior because of birth. Uh, and then, after that, he said because of scriptural learning, uh, because Brahmins are supposed to be uh, have great learning, la. they are versed in the three Vedas. La. And then after that, uh, the Buddha said, now you agree with me eh, that uh, uh, purification is for all four castes. Uh, uh, I guess what the Buddha, Buddha means eh, is that eh, when the birth is the same, eh, then eh, there are other qualities that are important. Uh, one is, uh, 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 this second one is the studious and acute one, uh, is the learning, like scriptural learning. And then the third one, uh, virtuous or good character, uh, is even more important. Uh, is even more important uh, than one who was studious and acute. Uh, so, uh, 
and this uh, person who is virtuous and of good character uh, it can be from any karma uh, earlier the buddha showed uh, that is not only brahmins uh, who can be virtuous uh, and of good character anybody uh, who keeps the uh, who 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 does not do unwholesome uh, actions uh, and uh, does all the wholesome ten wholesome actions uh, or ten wholesome karmas uh, uh, then uh, he is he is purified lah in which case uh, the most important uh, here the buddha shows uh, is uh, virtue lah a uh, good character lah uh, which is which is uh, similar to purification if a person is virtuous a good character uh, he purifies himself lah uh, so aslayana could not reply and said this mate lah knowing this the blessed one said to him once aslayana when seven brahmin seers were dwelling in leaf huts in the forest this pernicious view arose in them Brahmins are the highest caste those of any other caste are inferior etc etc now the seer devala the dark kanha devala heard this then he arranged his hair and beard dressed in ochre colored garments put on stout sandals and taking a staff made of gold he appeared in the courtyard of the seven brahmin seers then while walking up and down the courtyard of the seven brahmin seers the seer devala the dark spoke thus where have those worthy brahmin seers gone where have those worthy brahmin seers gone then the seven brahmin seers thought who is walking up and down in the courtyard of the seven brahmin seers like a village loud speaking thus where have those worthy brahmin seers gone where have those Bra- worthy brahmin seers gone let us curse him Then the seven Brahmin seers cursed the seer Devala the dark thus be ashes val one be ashes val one but the more the seven Brahmin seers cursed him the more comely beautiful and handsome the seer Devala the dark became then the seven Brahmin seers thought our asceticism is in vain our holy life is fruitless for formerly when we cursed anyone thus be ashes val one be ashes val one he always became ashes but the more we curse this one the more comely beautiful and handsome he becomes and this uh, devala said your asceticism is not in vain sirs your holy life is not fruitless but sirs put away your hatred towards me and they said we have put away our hatred towards you sir who are you have you heard of the seer devala the dark sirs yes sir i am he sirs Then the seven Brahmin seers went to the seer Devala the dark and paid homage to him. I'll stop here for a moment. These uh, in the olden days, uh, the Brahmins uh, were supposed to be the priest caste, uh, the ascetics, lah. Uh, and so these seven uh, Brahmins, uh, they were practicing meditation very hard, lah, uh, in the forest, uh, staying together uh, in leaf huts, lah. Uh, uh, so they must have uh, attained to uh, quite a high level uh, and they are very good with these mantras uh. so uh, so they see from here uh, that in the past uh, when they curse somebody uh, maybe they they curse either with their psychic power or with their mantras uh, that person will turn into ashes uh. uh. but this uh, devala uh, his psychic powers even more powerful uh. so however hard they tried to uh, kill him uh, burn him up uh, they could not do it uh. Uh, so when they heard that he was this famous uh, seer or rishi uh, devala the dark uh, they paid homage to him uh. then he said to them sirs i heard that while the seven brahmin seers were dwelling in leaf huts in the forest this pernicious view arose in them brahmins are the highest caste those of any other caste are inferior etc and they said that is so sir but sirs do you know if the mother you who bore you went only with the brahmin and never with a non brahmin and they said no sir but sirs do you know if your mother's mother's back to the seventh generation went only with brahmins and never with non brahmins and they said no sir but sirs do you know if the father who begot you went only with a brahmin woman and never with a non brahmin woman no sirs 
But sirs, do you know if your father's father is back to the seventh generation, went with only uh, Brahmin women and never with non-Brahmin women? No, sir. Uh, stop here for a moment. Uh. So here the Buddha is showing them, uh, you don't actually know uh, uh, whether you were born uh, from a pure uh, a Brahmin mother and father. Uh. Mm. Uh because you don't know who they uh, slept with and all these things. Uh. But sirs, do you know how the conception of an embryo in a womb comes about? Sir, we know how the conception of an embryo in a womb comes about. Here there is a union of the mother and father. And it is the mother season and the being to be reborn is present. Thus the conception of an embryo in a womb comes about through the union of these three things. Then, sirs, do you know for sure whether that being to be reborn is a noble or a Brahmin or a merchant or a worker? Sir, we do not know for sure whether that being to be reborn is a noble or a Brahmin or a merchant or a worker. That being so, sirs, then what are you? That being so, sir, we do not know what we are. Now, Asalayana, even those seven Brahmin seers on being pressed and questioned and cross-questioned by the seer Devala the Dark, on their own assertion about birth, were unable to support it. But how shall you, on being pressed and questioned and cross-questioned by me now, on your assertion about birth, be able to support it? You who rely on the teacher's doctrines are not even fit to be their spoon-holder, Puna. When this was said, the Brahmin student, Asalayana, said to the Blessed One, Magnificent Master Gautama, Magnificent Master Gautama, etc., from today, let Master Gautama remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge for life. Mm, that's the end of the sutta. So here the Buddha says, uh, in the past, uh, these seven Brahmin seers are uh, so arrogant about their birth, uh, but, they, but when they were uh, questioned and cross-questioned by the seer Devala, this seer Devala, he's a, uh, Devala the dark, uh, that means he's not a Brahmin. <laughs> Is 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 a uh, dark fellow uh, So uh, so when he question and cross question them, uh, they admitted uh, they they don't know uh, actually. Uh, before their birth, uh, they are supposed to be that uh, this uh, Gandaba, this uh, intermediate body uh, that lodges itself in the womb. Uh, so they don't know their previous birth, whether their previous birth, they were a Brahmin or a noble or a merchant or a worker. So that being so, they, 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 know, they, they don't really know what they were before. So, so the Buddha says, even these seven Brahmin seers with psychic power, they could not stand up to questioning by the seer Devala. How can you... Uh, stand up to my questioning lah. The Buddha says uh, You are not even fit nah, to be the spoon holder lah. Mm. So this is one of the suttas uh, That shows uh, how they like to argue about the Buddha, With the Buddha about their birth lah. Now we come to the next sutta, 94, Gotamukha Sutta, to Gotamukha. Thus have I heard, on one occasion the Venerable Udena was living at Banares in the Kemia Mango Grove. Now on that occasion the Brahmin Gotamukha had arrived in Banares for some business or other. And as he was walking and wandering for exercise, he came to the Kemia Mango Grove. At that time the Venerable Udena was walking up and down in the open. Then the Brahmin Gotamukha went up to the Venerable Udena and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, still walking up and down with the Venerable Udena, he said this, Worthy recluse, there is no wondrous life that accords with the Dhamma. So it seems to me here, and that may be because I have not seen such Venerable Ones as yourself, or because I have not seen the Dhamma here. Let's stop here for a moment. So here he is telling the Venerable Udena that there is no wondrous life that accords with the Dhamma uh, and that may be because I have not see, 
such member wants as he was. Uh, so probably what he means uh, is that uh, this wondrous life, uh, uh, when he says wondrous life, uh, it probably means uh, uh, ascetics uh, other than Brahmins. Uh, so he says no wondrous life that accords with the Dhamma in others, uh, that uh, the wondrous, uh, the ascetics uh, who are not Brahmins, uh, they cannot uh, really attain any high state la, you know, uh, that accords with the Dhamma la, or that this uh, wondrous uh, their Dhamma uh, they don't really have the, the, the real Dhamma la, uh. when this was said the Venerable Udena stepped down from the walk and went into his dwelling where he sat down on a seat made ready and Gotamukha too stepped down from the walk and went into the dwelling where he stood at one side then the Venerable Udena said to him, There are seats, Brahmin, sit down if you wish. And he said, We did not sit down because we were waiting for Master Udena to speak. For how could one like myself presume to sit down on a seat without first being invited to do so? Then the Brahmin Gotamukha took a low seat, sat down at one side, and said to the Venerable Udena, Worthy recluse, there is no wondrous life that accords with the Dhamma. So it seems to me here, and that may be because I have not seen such venerable ones as yourself or because I have not seen the Dhamma here. And Venerable Udena said, Brahmin, if you think any statement of mine is to be agreed with, then agree with it. If you think any statement of mine is to be argued against, then argue against it. And if you do not understand the meaning of any statement of mine, <clears throat> ask me to clarify it thus. How is this? Master Udena, what is the meaning of this? In this way we can discuss this matter. And he said, Master Udena, if I think any statement of Master Udena's is to be agreed upon, uh, is to be agreed with, I shall agree with it. If I think any statement of his is to be argued against, I shall argue against it. And if I do not understand the meaning of any statement of Master Udena's, then I shall ask Master Udena to clarify it thus. How is this, Master Udena? What is the meaning of this? In this way, let us discuss this matter. i stop here for a moment. So when this uh, Brahmin uh, said, uh, what he said, uh, that there is uh, no wondrous life uh, that accords with the Dhamma, so the Venerable Udena uh, took it as a challenge uh, that he wanted to debate with him. Uh, so he went into his kuti uh, and sat down. Uh, and this uh, Gotamukha uh, seems like he's quite polite. Uh, he, had high re he has some regard for this Master Udena. So he took a lower seat. Uh, and this uh, Venerable Udena stated, so it's like uh, st stated the terms uh, of the debate. Uh, uh, and he, he agreed uh, to stick to these terms. Uh, and Venerable Udena said, Brahmin, there are four kinds of persons to be found existing in the world. What four? Then he quotes the Sutta 51, uh, uh, section 5 to 6. Uh, this is about the person uh, who uh, torments himself, uh, but do, does not torment others. Uh, the first one, the second one, uh, uh, let me see, uh, page 445. Mm. It's on page 445. La. Um, the first type of person uh, torments himself. La. The second type uh, torments others. La. The ter third type uh, torments himself uh, and torments others. La. The fourth type does not torment himself uh, and does not torment others. Uh. But Master Udena, the kind of person who does not torment himself, uh, so he, he asks uh, this uh, Gotamukha, oh, this four, of these four persons, uh, who do you, which one appeals to you? Uh? And he said, the kind of person who does not torment himself or pursue the practice of torturing himself and who, does, who, and who does not torment others or pursue the practice of torturing others, who since he torments neither himself nor others, is here and now hungerless, extinguished and cooled, and abides experiencing bliss, 
having himself become holy. He does not torment and torture either himself or others, both of whom desire pleasure and recoil from pain. That is why this kind of person satisfies by my mind. So in the same way, uh, he praises the last type of person uh, who does not torment himself nor others. Uh. And the, the Brahma Udena said, Brahmin, there are two kinds of assembly. What two? Here a certain assembly lusts after jewels and earrings and seeks wives and children, men and women slaves, fields and land, gold and silver. But here a certain assembly does not lust after jewels and earrings, but having abandoned wives and children, men and women slaves, fields and land, gold and silver, has gone forth from the home life into homelessness. Now there is this kind of person who does not torment himself or pursue the practice of torturing himself, and who does not torment others or pursue the practice of torturing others who, since he torments neither himself nor others, is here and now hungerless, extinguished and cooled, and abides experiencing bliss, having himself become holy. In which of the two kinds of assembly do you usually see this person, Brahmin? In the assembly that lasts after jewels and earrings, and seeks wives and children, men and women slaves, fields and land, gold and silver, or in the assembly that does not lust after jewels and earrings, but having abandoned wives and children, etc., has gone forth from the home life into homelessness. I usually see this kind of person, Master Udena, in the assembly that does not lust after jewels and earrings, but having abandoned wives and children, etc., has gone forth from the home life into homelessness. And then Brahma Udena said, But only just now, Brahmin, we understood you to say, Worthy recluse, there is no wondrous life that accords with the Dhamma. So it seems to me here, and that may be because I have not seen such venerable ones as yourself, or because I have not seen the Dhamma here. And he said, Certainly, Master Udena, it was in order to learn that I spoke those words. There is a wondrous life that accords with the Dhamma. And so it seems to me here, and may, and may Master Udena remember me to have spoken thus. It would be good if, out of compassion, Master Udena would expound to me in detail those four kinds of persons he mentioned in brief. Uh, stop here for a moment. Uh. So here, uh, out of the four types of persons, uh, uh, this uh, Gotamukha I say, is the last type, uh, one who tortures neither himself, nor others uh, is the best, la. is cool already, la. Uh, become holy. La. Uh. Then uh, Venerable Udena asked him, la, uh, where are you likely to see this type of person, la? Uh, among householders or among renunciants? La. Then he said, among renunciants. La. Uh, that means wondrous. La. <clears throat> then the Venerable Udena said, but just now you said there is no wondrous life that accords with Dhamma. Uh, then he he said he said that now only just to learn. Uh, then so now he asks uh, remember Udena to 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 describe in detail the four types of persons. La. Then Brahmin, listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, sir, the Brahmin Gotamukha replied. Remember Udena said this. Brahmin, what kind of person torments himself and, pers and pursues the practice of torturing himself? Here a certain person goes naked, etc. etc. Uh, so this uh, description of the four types of persons uh, are exactly as in Sutta number 51, Majjhima Nikaya, uh, section 8 to 28. Uh, that's on page 446 to 453. Uh, so I won't go through that uh, because it's, you can see it in the book. Uh. When this was said, the Brahmin Gotamukha said to the Venerable Udena, Magnificent Master Udena, Magnificent Master Udena, Master Udena has made the Dhamma clear in many ways, as though he were turning upright, but had been overthrown, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost, or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see forms. I go to Master Udena for refuge, and to the Dhamma, and to the Sangha of monks. From today, let Master Udena remember me as a lay follower, who has gone to him for refuge for life. And Rambo Udena said, Do not go to me for refuge, Brahmin. Go for refuge to that same Blessed One to whom I have gone for refuge. Where is he living now, that Master Gotama, Arahan Samasambuddha, Master Udena? That Blessed One, Arahan Samasambuddha, has attained final Nibbana, Brahmin. And he said, If we heard that Master Gotama was within ten leagues, we would go ten leagues in order to see that Master Gotama. 
Arahan Samasam Buddha. If we heard that Master Gotama was within 20 leagues, 30, 40, 50, 100 leagues, we would go 100 leagues in order to see that Master Gotama, Arahan Samasam Buddha. But since that Master Gotama has attained to final Nibbana, we go to that Master Gotama for refuge and to the Dhamma and to the Sangha of monks. From today, let Master Udena remember me as a lay follower who has gone for refuge for life. Now, Master Udena, the king of Anga, gives me a daily donation. Let me give Master Udena a regular donation from that. What kind of regular, regular donation does the king of Anga give you, Brahmin? 500 kahapanas, Master Udena. It is not allowable for us to accept gold and silver, Brahmin. That means money. Nah. If it is not allowable for Master Udena, I will have a monastery built for Master Udena. If you desire to have a monastery built for me, Brahmin, have an assembly hall built for the Sangha at Patali Putta. That means a sala. Huh? I am still more satisfied and pleased that Master Udena suggests that I give a gift to the Sangha. So with this regular donation and another regular donation, I shall have an assembly hall built for the Sangha at Patali Putta. Then with that regular donation which he offered to Master Udena and another regulation, uh, another regular donation added to it, the Brahmin Gotamukha had an assembly hall built for the Sangha at Patali Putta and that is now known as the Gotamukhi. Uh, that's the end of the sutta. So here you can see here uh, that these uh, Brahmins, uh, some of them, uh, like this, this, this man, uh, he has a daily allowance uh, of 500 kahapanas, maybe you can say $500 lah, from the king uh, every day. Uh. Mm. Gives me a daily donation, so $500 every day. Uh. Uh, so he wanted to give that to the monk, uh, but the monk says we cannot accept money. Lah. Then he wanted to build a monastery for him, and, the, and the, this monk didn't want a monastery and asked him to build a, a sala, lah, assembly hall lah, for the Sangha. So he said, uh, with this regular donation and another regular donation, uh, uh, so he will do it. Lah, uh. So these Brahmins, I can see, uh, originally Brahmins were supposed to be ascetics. Lah. Uh, and they meditated and begged for their food uh, and that's how they attain uh, psychic powers uh, and from their psychic powers uh, they probably converse with the devas and learn a lot of mantras uh, words of power uh. so after having uh, all these mantras and some of them psychic power uh, they were employed by the kings uh, to become their advisors uh. So after that, uh, the Brahmin caste uh, became lay persons uh, instead of ascetics. Uh, uh, they, they start to possess property, wives and uh, slaves and uh, land and like this one, uh, he gets a regular allowance from the king. Uh, uh. So that's why you can see from this sutta, uh, at that time uh, the Brahmins had become lay persons already. Uh, so he, he thought uh, a wondrous life. Uh, it's no use, there's no, no such thing as a wondrous life that accords with Dhamma, that means a uh, wondrous life, uh, ascetic life, uh, that leads to uh, uh, this uh, uh, Nibbana, that leads to stages of, pure, uh, uh, stages of holiness and all these things. Uh, but uh, this way Buddha convinced him otherwise. Uh, Okay, now we come to Sutta 95. Chanki Sutta with Chanki. Thus have I heard. This one also is interesting. On one occasion, the Blessed One was wandering in the Kosalan country with a large Sangha of monks. And eventually he arrived at a Kosalan Brahmin village named Opa Sada. There the Blessed One stayed in the God's Grove, the Sala tree grove to the north of Opa Sada. Now on that occasion, the Brahmin Chanki was ruling over Opa Sada a crown property abounding in living beings, rich in grasslands, woodlands, waterways and grain, a royal endowment, a sacred grant given to him by King Pasanadi of Kosala. Stop here for a moment. Nah. So this is another famous Brahmin. Nah. And 
is given uh, all this uh, uh, this property uh, uh, upasada la, so it's ruling over it la, like a sultan or something la, uh, uh, and uh, and this was given him to him by the king la. the brahmin householders of upasada heard the recluse gotama uh, this uh, description uh, of this uh, buddha uh, where they praise the buddha for being an arahan and all that la. and it's good to see such arahans then the Brahmin householders of Opasada set forth from Opasada in groups and bands and headed northwards to the God's grove, the Sala tree grove. Now on that occasion, the Brahmin Chanki had retired to the upper story of his mansion for his midday rest. There he saw the Brahmin householders of Opasada setting forth from Opasada in groups and bands and heading northwards to the God's grove, the Sala tree grove. When he saw them, he asked his minister, Good minister, why are the Brahmin householders of Opasada setting forth from Opasada in groups and bands and heading northwards to the God's grove, the Sala tree grove? Sir, there is the recluse Gotama, the son of the Sakyans, who went forth from the Sakyan clan, who has been wandering in the Kosalan country, etc., etc. They are going to see that Master Gotama. Then, good minister, go to the Brahmin householders of Opasada and tell them, Sirs, the Brahmin Chanki says this. Please wait, sirs. The Brahmin Chanki will also go to see the recluse Gotama. Yes, sir, the minister replied. And he went to the Brahmin householders of Opasada and gave them the message. Now, on that occasion, 500 Brahmins from various states were staying at Opasada for some business or other. They heard the Brahmin Chanki, it seems, Ah, sorry, the Brahmin Chanki, it is said, is going to see the recluse Gotama. Then they went to the Brahmin Chanki and asked him, Sir, is it true that you are going to see the recluse Gotama? So it is, sirs, I am going to see the recluse Gotama. And they said, Sir, do not go to see the recluse Gotama. It is not proper, Master Chanki, for you to go and see the recluse Gotama. Rather, it is proper for the recluse Gotama to come and see you. For you, sir, are well born on both sides of pure maternal and paternal descent seven generations back, unassailable and impeccable in the respect of birth. Since that is so, Master Chanki, it is not proper for you to go to see the recluse Gotama. Rather, it is proper for the recluse Gotama to come to see you. You, sir, are rich with great wealth and great possessions. You, sir, are a master of the three Vedas with their vocabularies, liturgy, phonology, and etymology, and the histories as a fifth. Skilled in philology and grammar, you are fully versed in natural philosophy and in the marks of a great man. You, sir, are handsome, comely, and graceful, possessing supreme beauty of complexion, with sublime beauty and sublime presence, remarkable to behold. You, sir, are virtuous, mature in virtue, possessing mature virtue. You, sir, are a good speaker with a good delivery. You speak words that are courteous, distinct, flawless, and communicate the meaning. You, sir, teach the, te you, sir, teach the teachers of many, and you teach the recitation of the hymns to 300 Brahmin students. You, sir, are honored, respected, revered, venerated, and esteemed by King Pasnadi of Kosala. You, sir, are honored, respected, revered, venerated, and esteemed by the Brahmin Pokhara Sati. You, sir, rule over Opasada, a crown property abounding in living beings, etc., a sacred grant given to you by King Pasnadi of Kosala. Since this is so, Master Chanki, it is not proper for you to go to see the recluse Gotama. Rather, it is proper for the recluse Gotama to come to see you. Stop here for a moment. Eh? So here, these uh, 500 Brahmins, uh, having come from other states, uh, and they heard that this famous uh, Brahmin Chanki was going to visit the Buddha, uh, they were not happy uh, because they think uh, they are the superior caste. Uh, uh, somebody like the Buddha, uh, they, they, they say, they consider uh, inferior uh, and uh, they think uh, that the Buddha should come to this Chanki instead of Chanki going to see him. Uh. When this was said, the Brahmin Chanki told those Brahmins, Now, sirs, hear from me why it is proper for me to go to see Master Gotama, and why it is not proper for Master Gotama to come to see me. 
Sirs, the recluse Gautama is well born on both sides of pure maternal and paternal descent, seven generations back, unassailable and impeccable in respect of birth. Since this is so, sirs, it is not proper for Master Gotama to come to see me. Rather, it is proper for me to go to see Master Gotama. Sirs, the recluse Gotama went forth, abandoning much gold and bullion, stored away in vaults and depositories. Sirs, the recluse Gotama went forth from the home life into homelessness while still young, a black-haired young man endowed with the blessing of youth in the prime of life. Sirs, the recluse Gotama shaved off his hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and went forth from the home life into homelessness, though his mother and father wished otherwise, and wept with tearful faces. Sirs, the recluse Gotama is handsome, comely, and graceful, possessing supreme beauty of complexion, and with sublime beauty and sublime presence, remarkable to behold. Sirs, the recluse Gotama is virtuous, with noble virtue, with wholesome virtue, possessing wholesome virtue. Sirs, the recluse Gotama is a good speaker, with a good delivery. He speaks words that are courteous, distinct, flawless, and communicate the meaning. Sirs, the recluse Gotama is a teacher of the teachers of many. Sirs, the recluse Gotama is free from sensual lust and is without personal vanity. Sirs, the recluse Gotama holds the doctrine of the moral efficacy of action, the doctrine of the moral efficacy of deeds. He does not seek any harm for the line of Brahmins. Sirs, the recluse Gotama went forth from an aristocratic family, from one of the original noble families. Sirs, the recluse Gotama went forth from a rich family, from a family of great wealth and great possessions. Sirs, people come from remote kingdoms and remote districts to question the recluse Gotama. Sirs, many thousands of deities have gone for refuge for life to the recluse Gotama. Sirs, a good report of the recluse Gotama has been spread to this effect. That blessed one is Arahan, Samasambuddha, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime, knower of worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened, blessed. Sirs, the recluse Gotama possesses the 32 marks of a great man. Sirs, King Senia Bimbisara of Magadha and his wife and children have gone for refuge for life to the recluse Gotama. Sirs, King Pasnadi of Kosala and his wife and children have gone for refuge for life to the recluse Gotama. Sirs, the Brahmin Pokhara Sati and his wife and children have gone for refuge for life to the recluse Gotama. Sirs, the recluse Gotama has arrived at Opasada and is living at Opasada in the God's Grove, the Sala Tree Grove to the north of Opasada. Now any recluses or Brahmins that come to our town are our guests, and guests should be honoured, respected, revered and venerated by us. Since the recluse Gotama has arrived at Opasada, he is our guest, and as our guest should be honoured, respected, revered, and venerated by us. Since that is so, sirs, it is not proper for Master Gotama to come to see me. Rather, it is proper for me to go to see the Master Gotama. And they said, sirs, this much is the, uh, sorry, this, sirs, this much is the praise of Master Gotama that I have learned. But the praise of Master Gotama is not limited to that. For the praise of Master Gotama is immeasurable. Since Master Gotama possesses each of these factors, it is not proper for me, for him to come to see me. Rather, it is proper for me to go to see Master Gotama. Therefore, sirs, let all of us go to see the recluse Gotama. Then the Brahmin Chanki, together with a large company of Brahmins, went to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side. Uh, stop here for a moment. So even, you see, even though he has heard uh, and believes uh, that the Buddha uh, is an Arahan, Samasam Buddha, still, uh, maybe because of their pride, uh, they, of their, maybe they think that their Brahmins are superior, uh, he didn't uh, pay homage to the Buddha, uh, just exchanged greetings with the Buddha uh, and sat down. Uh. Now on that occasion, the Blessed One was seated, finishing some amiable talk with some very senior Brahmins. At the time, sitting in the assembly was a Brahmin student named Kapatika. 
young, shaven headed, 16 years old. He was a master of the three Vedas with their vocabularies, liturgy, phonology, and etymology, and the histories as a fifth. Skilled in philology and grammar, he was fully versed in natural philosophy and the marks of the great man. While the very senior Brahmins were conversing with the Blessed One, he often broke in and interrupted their talk. Then the Blessed One rebuked the Brahmin student Kapatika thus, Let not the Venerable Bharadvaja break in and interrupt the talk of the very senior Brahmins while they are conversing. Let the Venerable Bharadvaja wait until the talk is finished. When this was said, the Brahmin Chanki said to the Blessed One, Let not Master Gautama rebuke the Brahmin student Kapatika. The Brahmin student Kapatika is a clansman. He is very learned. He, he has a good delivery. He is wise. He is capable of taking part in this discussion with Master Gautama. Then the Blessed One thought, Surely, since the Brahmins honor him thus, the Brahmin student Kapatika must be accomplished in the scriptures of the three Vedas. Then the Brahmin student Kapatika thought, When the recluse Gotama catches my eye, I shall ask him a question. Then knowing with his own mind the thought in the Brahmin student Kapatika's mind, the Blessed One turned his eye towards him. Then the Brahmin student Kapatika thought, The recluse Gotama has turned towards me. Suppose I ask him a question. Then he said to the Blessed One, Master Gotama, in regard to the ancient Brahmanic hymns that have come down through oral transmission and in the scriptural collections, the Brahmins come to the definite conclusion, only this is true, anything else is wrong. What does Master Gotama say about this? I stop here for a moment. So here he's asking the Buddha uh, that uh, according to our tradition, uh, all the Brahmanic uh, hymns uh, that we chant, uh, only this is true. Uh, anything else uh, of other religions uh, is wrong. Uh. Just like some people of certain religions, uh, they think uh, that only their religion is the correct one, uh, all other religions are wrong. Uh. How then, Bharat Vajra, among the Brahmins, is there even a single Brahmin who says thus, I know this, I see this, only this is true, anything else is wrong? No, Master Gotama. How then, Bharat Vajra, among the Brahmins, is there even a single teacher or a single teacher's teacher back to the seventh generation of teachers who says thus, I know this, I see this, only this is true, anything else is wrong? No, Master Gotama. In other words, uh, the Buddha is asking uh, whether any one of these Brahmin teachers, uh, they know directly uh, that this is true. Uh, they see for themselves, uh, uh, that means we are implying uh, uh, psychic power uh, that they, they know and see uh, all this directly uh, by themselves uh, and he says no uh. how then Bharat Bhaja, the ancient Brahmin seers, the creators of the hymns, the composers of the hymns, whose ancient hymns that were formerly chanted uttered and compiled, the Brahmins nowadays still chant and repeat repeating what was spoken and reciting what was recited that is, Ataka, Vamaka, Vamadeva, Vesamita, Yamatagi, Angirasa, Bharadvaja, Vaseta, Kasapa, and Bagu. Did even these ancient Brahmin seers say thus, We know this, we see this, only this is true, anything else is wrong? No, Master Gautama. Stop here for a moment. Huh? You see here, huh? the Buddha can quote to them huh? their ancient. Uh, uh, Brahmin seers, uh, those who created their hymns, uh, uh, and he can mention all these names: uh, Ataka, Vamaka, Vamadeva, Vesamita, etc. Uh, probably, uh, many of these Brahmins don't even know uh, who are these ancestors of theirs. Uh, so the Buddha said, uh, these ancient Brahmin seers say uh, they, that they know directly, they see directly this. Uh, uh, only their, their, their hymns are correct, everybody else is wrong. And they say no, and he said no, Master Gautama. So Bharat Bhaja, it seems that among the Brahmins, there is not even a single Brahmin who says thus, I know this, I see this, only this is true, anything else is wrong. And among, among the Brahmins, there is not even a single teacher or a single teacher's teacher back to the seventh generation of teachers who says thus, I know this, I see this, only this is true, anything else is wrong. 
And the ancient Brahmin seers, the creators of the hymns, the composers of the hymns, whose ancient hymns that were formerly chanted, uttered and compiled, the Brahmins nowadays still chant and repeat, uh, that is, Ataka, Vamaka, etc. Even these ancient Brahmin seers did not say thus, we know this, we see this, only this is true, anything else is wrong. Suppose there were a file of blind men, each in touch with the next, the first one does not see, the middle one does not see, the last one does not see. So too, Bharat Bhaja, in regard to their statement, the Brahmins seem to be like a file of blind men. First one does not see, the middle one does not see, the last one does not see. What do you think, Bharat Bhaja? That being so, does not the faith of the Brahmins turn out to be groundless? Stop here for a moment. Uh, so you can see here, uh, in front of many hundreds of these Brahmins, uh, the Buddha is putting them down, uh, saying that uh, you Brahmins, uh, you claim uh, only your teaching is true, uh, but your teachers, uh, all of you are like blind men, uh, one leading, uh, following the, the, the one in front, uh, but all are blind, not even a single one of you uh, uh, have seen this truth directly uh, and uh, know directly. Uh. Uh, this is uh, quite a statement to make uh, in front of uh, several hundred uh, Brahmins uh, who are so arrogant about their, their, their caste. Uh. <clears throat> then he said, the Brahmins honor this not only out of faith, Master Gautama, they also honor it as oral tradition. And the Buddha said, Bharat Bhaja, first you took your stand on faith, now you speak of oral tradition. There are five things, Bharat Bhaja, that may, turn, that may turn out in two different ways here and now. What five? Faith, approval, oral tradition, reason, cogitation, and reflective acceptance of a view. These five things may turn out in two different ways here and now. Now something may be fully accepted out of faith, yet it may be empty, hollow, and false. But something else may not be fully accepted out of faith, yet it may be factual, true, and unmistaken. Again, something may be fully approved of, or may be well cogitated, may be well reflected upon, yet it may be empty, hollow, and false, but something else uh, may, may not be well reflected upon, yet it may be factual, true, and unmistaken. Under these conditions, it is not proper for a wise man who preserves truth to come to the definite conclusion, only this is true, anything else is wrong. Stop here for a moment. So here, the Buddha anticipated that he was probably going to bring up all the other things. So the Buddha told him there are five things. You can stick your stand on faith as you originally did. Or you can take your stand on oral tradition. Uh, and there are three more. Uh, you can take your stand on reason, cogitation, or uh, approval or reflective acceptance of a view. Uh, but any one of these five, the Buddha says, uh, it may be true or it may be false. Uh, so even before he has brought up all the others, uh, the Buddha already uh, told him uh, all these are uh, possible. Uh, then he said, but Master Gautama, in what way is there the preservation of truth? How does one preserve truth? We ask Master Gautama about the preservation of truth. Uh, so you see the last sen sentence of the Buddha, uh, the Buddha said, uh, under these conditions, it is not proper for a wise man who preserves truth uh, to come to the definite conclusion, only this is true, anything else is wrong. Uh, so this uh, young Brahmin, uh, he realized uh, that he could not argue with the Buddha. La. So he stops arguing here uh, and he wants to learn from the Buddha. La. He humbles himself uh, and asks the Buddha, in what way is there a preservation of truth? La? Since the Buddha mentioned about the wise man who preserves truth, uh, then he asks how to preserve truth. La. And the Buddha said, if a person has faith, Bharat Vajra, he preserves truth when he says, my faith is thus. But he does not yet come to the definite conclusion, only this is true, anything else is wrong. In this way, Bharat Vajra, there is the preservation of truth. In this way, he preserves truth. In this way, we describe the preservation of truth. But as yet, there is no discovery of truth. Similarly, if a person approves of something, or if he receives an oral tradition, 
or he reaches a conclusion based on reason cogitation or if he regain or if he gains a reflective acceptance of a view he preserves truth when he says huh? my reflective acceptance of a view is thus but he does not yet come to the definite conclusion only this is true anything else is wrong in this way too Bharat Bhaja there is preservation of truth in this way he preserves truth in this way we describe the preservation of truth but as yet there is no discovery of truth so the Buddha uh, explained to him uh, uh, what, he, what, he, what is meant by preservation of truth uh, but the Buddha says uh, at this point, uh, there's still no discovery of truth. La. And he asks, In that way, Master Gautama, there is the preservation of truth. In that way, one preserves truth. In that way, we recognize the preservation of truth. But in what way, Master Gautama, is there the discovery of truth? In what way does one discover truth? We ask Master Gautama about the discovery of truth. Here, Bharat Vajra, a monk may be living in dependence on some village or town. Then a householder or a householder's son goes to him and investigates him in regard to three kinds of states, in regard to states based on greed, in regard to states based on hatred, and in regard to states based on delusion. Are there in this venerable one any states based on greed such that with his mind obsessed by those states, while not knowing he might say, I know, or while not seeing he might say, I see, or he might urge others to act in a way that would lead to their harm and suffering for a long time. As he investigates him, he comes to know there are no such states based on greed in this venerable one. The bodily behavior and the verbal behavior of this venerable one are not those of one affected by greed. And the Dhamma that this venerable one teaches is profound, hard to see and hard to understand, peaceful and sublime, unattainable by mere reasoning, subtle to be experienced by the wise. This Dhamma cannot easily be taught by one affected by greed. When he has investigated him and has seen that he is purified from states based on greed, he next investigates him in regard to states based on hatred. Are there in this venerable one any states based on hatred, such that with his mind obsessed by those states, etc., he might urge others to act in a way that would lead to the harm and suffering for a long time? As he investigates him, he comes to know there are no such states based on hate in this venerable one. The bodily behavior and verbal behavior of this venerable one are not those of one affected by hate. And the Dhamma that this venerable one teaches is profound, etc., to be experienced by the wise. This Dhamma cannot easily be taught by one affected by hate. When he has investigated him and has seen that he is purified from states based on hate, he next investigates him in regard to states based on delusion. Are there in this venerable one any states based on delusion such that with his mind obsessed by these states, etc., he might urge others to act in a way that would lead to their harm and suffering for a long time? As he investigates him, he comes to know there are no such states based on delusion in this venerable one. The bodily behavior and verbal behavior of this venerable one are not those of one affected by delusion. And the Dhamma that this venerable one teaches is profound, etc., to be experienced by the wise. This Dhamma cannot easily be taught by one affected by delusion. Uh, so here, I'll stop here for a moment. Uh, so here the Buddha says uh, that uh, uh, a lay person, uh, when he comes to a monk, uh, um, before he can have faith in the monk, uh, he should investigate uh, uh, whether that monk uh, uh, has uh, greed, hatred, or delusion or not. Uh, and these states, uh, if he has, uh, it is evident uh, by his uh, uh, bodily behavior, verbal behavior, and mental. Uh, so. Uh, so the Buddha is saying, uh, when you come to a teacher, uh, you have to investigate him uh, in these three aspects. Uh. When he has investigated him and has seen that he is purified from states based on delusion, then he places faith in him. Filled with faith, he visits him and pays respect to him. Having paid respect to him, he gives ear. When he gives ear, he hears the Dhamma. Having heard the Dhamma, he memorizes it and examines the meaning of the teachings he has memorized. When he examines their meaning, he gains a reflective acceptance of those teachings. When he has gained a reflective acceptance of those teachings, zeal springs up. When zeal has sprung up, 
he applies his will. Having applied his will, he scrutinizes. Having scrutinized, he strives. Resolutely striving, he realizes with the body the ultimate truth and sees it by penetrating it with wisdom. In this way, Bharat Bhaja, there is the discovery of truth. In this way, one discovers truth. In this way, we describe the discovery of truth. But as yet, there is no final arrival at truth. Uh, stop here for a moment. Uh. So here, uh, you see these uh, steps. Uh, uh, it's uh, worthwhile uh, to pay careful attention here. Uh, uh, when a person comes to a prospective teacher, uh, first he must investigate him, uh, whether he has greed, hatred and delusion. Uh, and when he sees uh, that he has no greed, hatred and delusion, uh, and he teaches a Dhamma that is profound, uh, then he places faith in the teacher. Uh, and then having faith in the teacher, uh, he should visit the teacher often. Uh, and when he visits the teacher, uh, he should be respectful. Uh, and when he is respectful, uh, the teacher teaches him the Dhamma. Uh, uh, then he uh, hears the Dhamma and memorizes the Dhamma. La. In those days, they had no books, la, so they had to memorize. La. And nowadays, it's more convenient. Uh, we have books. Uh. And then examine the, the meaning of the, the Dhamma. La. Mm. And then when he understands, uh, then he gains a reflective acceptance. La. Mm. And then um, zeal springs up. La. Uh, and then after that, uh, he starts to cultivate uh, his, the, the holy path, la. applies his will, la. and scrutinizes, la. and then he strives, la. Uh, and then realizes uh, with the body the ultimate truth. Realizes with the body, uh, that means uh, he attains the uh, jhanas, la. Uh, the states of meditative absorption uh, with the body, la. and then penetrates it with wisdom. La. Uh, in that way, Master Gautama, there is the discovery of truth. In that way, one discovers truth. In that way, we recognize the discovery of truth. But in what way, Master Gautama, is there the final arrival at truth? In what way does one finally arrive at truth? We ask Master Gautama about the final arrival at truth. And the Buddha said, The final arrival at truth, Pradvaja, lies in the repetition, development and cultivation of those same things. In this way, Bharat Bhaja, there is the final arrival at truth. In this way, one finally arrives at truth. In this way, we describe the final arrival at truth. I'll stop here for a moment. So here, having learned the Dhamma and uh, cultivating the holy path, uh, the Buddha said, uh, you have to repeat, uh, repeat uh, repetition, development, uh, uh, and cultivation uh, of those same things, la. Uh, then finally uh, you arrive at the truth. La. In that way, Master Gautama, there is the final arrival at truth. In that way, one finally arrives at truth. In that way, we recognize the final arrival at truth. But what, Master Gautama, is most helpful for the final arrival at truth? We ask Master Gautama about the thing most helpful for the final arrival at truth. And the Buddha said, striving is the most helpful for the final arrival at truth, Paratbhaja. If one does not strive, one will not finally arrive at truth. But because one strives, one does finally arrive at truth. That is why striving is most helpful for the final arrival at truth. This striving can also uh, be said uh, to be energetic effort. Nah. Mm, energetic effort, uh, diligence uh, is most helpful. Nah. But what Master Gautama is most <coughs> helpful for striving, we ask Master Gautama about the thing most helpful for striving. Scrutiny is most helpful for striving, Bharat Bhaja. If one does not scrutinize, one will not strive. But because one scrutinizes, one strives. That is why scrutiny is most helpful for striving. But what Master Gautama is most helpful for scrutiny? We ask Master Gautama about the thing most helpful for scrutiny. Application of will is most helpful for scrutiny, Bharat Bhaja. If one does not apply one's will, one will not scrutinize. But because one applies one's will, one scrutinizes. That is why application of will is most helpful for scrutiny. But what Master Gotama is most helpful for application of will? We ask Master Gotama about the thing most helpful for application of will. Zeal is most helpful for application of will, Bharat Vajja. If one does not arouse zeal, one will not apply one's will. 
but because one arouses zeal, one applies one's will. That is why zeal is most helpful for application of the will. But what Master Gotama is most helpful for zeal? We ask Master Gotama about the thing most helpful for zeal. A reflective acceptance of the teachings is most helpful for zeal, Bharat Vajya. If one does not gain a reflective acceptance of the teachings, zeal will not spring up. But because one gains a reflective acceptance of the teachings, zeal springs up. That is why a reflective acceptance of the teachings is most helpful for zeal. Stop here for a moment. Uh. This one, uh, in our Dhamma, reflective acceptance of the teachings means uh, you learn the Dhamma, uh, especially on the Four Noble Truths, uh, and you understand. Uh, when you understand, uh, then you get a reflective acceptance. Uh. And when this happens, uh, you have attained right view. You've entered the stream. Uh. But what Master Gotama is most helpful for a reflective acceptance of the teachings? We ask Master Gotama about the thing most helpful for a reflective acceptance of the teachings. Examination of the teaching is most helpful for a reflective acceptance of the teachings, Bharat Vajra. If one does not examine their meaning, well, one will not gain a reflective acceptance of the teachings. But because one examines their meaning, one gains a reflective acceptance of the teachings. That is why examination of the meaning is most helpful for a reflective acceptance of the teachings. But Master Gotama, but what Master Gotama is most helpful for examination of the meaning? We ask Master Gotama about the thing most helpful for examination of meaning. Memorizing the teachings is most helpful for examining the meaning, Bharat Vajra. If one does not memorize a teaching, one will not examine its meaning. But because one memorizes a teaching, one examines its meaning. Stop here for a moment. Now, this memorizing the teachings, uh, I mentioned, uh, it was because in the past uh, they did not have books. Uh, so they had to uh, repeat uh, the Dhamma that they had heard, uh, especially like the suttas. Uh, they repeat it. Uh, then, uh, it becomes more familiar to them. Uh, then from there they examine the meaning. Uh, but nowadays, uh, memorizing the teachings, uh, you can see, uh, can be replaced uh, by studying the suttas uh, in the book form, uh, the nikayas. Uh, you keep uh, reading the nikayas again and again and again and again. Uh, it's just like memorizing the teachings. Uh, or listening to the Dhamma talks uh, like, uh, like these, uh, Dhamma talks based on the suttas. Uh, I listen to them again and again and again and again. Uh, then it slowly sinks in. Uh, that is uh, equivalent to memorizing the teachings. Uh. But what Master Gotama is most helpful for memorizing the teachings? We ask Master Gotama about the thing most helpful for memorizing the teachings. Hearing the Dhamma is most helpful for memorizing the teachings, Bharat Vajra. If one does not hear the Dhamma, one will not memorize the teachings. But because one hears the Dhamma, one memorizes the teachings. That's why hearing the Dhamma is most helpful for memorizing the teachings. But what Master Gotama is most helpful for hearing the Dhamma? We ask Master Gotama about the thing most helpful for hearing the Dhamma. Giving ear is most helpful for hearing the Dhamma, Bharat Vajra. If one does not give ear, one will not hear the Dhamma. But because one gives ear, one hears the Dhamma. That is why giving ear is most helpful for hearing the Dhamma. Uh, stop here for a moment. Uh. So, uh, uh, the willingness uh, to learn the Dhamma, uh, to hear the Dhamma, or to read the Dhamma, uh, that is very important. Uh. Only when you understand the Dhamma and you gain a reflective acceptance of the teachings, uh, then only you can progress uh, to uh, Aryan stages. Uh. If you don't hear the Dhamma, you cannot get right view. Uh. And if you cannot get right view, uh, you have not entered on the Noble Eightfold Path. The Noble Eightfold Path always starts with the first factor, the right view. But what Master Gotama is most helpful for giving ear? We ask Master Gotama about the thing most helpful for giving ear. Paying respect is most helpful for giving ear, Bharat Vajra. If one does not pay respect, one will not give ear, but because one pays respect, one gives ear. That is why paying respect is most helpful for giving ear. Stop here for a moment. Uh. This paying respect, uh, you, you see the Buddha mentioned, uh, is, is quite important. Uh, some people, they come to the Dhamma, they are very arrogant. 
uh, they find it very difficult uh, to pay respect to a monk. Uh, so uh, if they have this kind of attitude, uh, it's an obstruction uh, because if a person has this type of attitude, uh, it shows uh, that the person thinks uh, that he knows everything, uh, that he knows a lot. Uh, so he is not willing to humble himself. Uh, uh, only when you are willing to humble yourself, uh, uh, then only uh, you are willing to give ear, uh, willing to, uh, to hear what the teacher says uh, instead of having all your own opinions. Uh, uh, so uh, this respect, uh, also paying respect is also very helpful. Uh. That's why, like in the Thai tradition, uh, uh, new uh, novice monks, uh, uh, either Samanera or even uh, Bhikkhu, uh, fully ordained monk, uh, if he's still a new, uh, whenever he speaks to the teacher uh, in Thailand, uh, they have to put their palms together, uh, Anjali. Every time they speak to the teacher, uh, they Anjali. And this tradition, uh, it's not only for disciples, la. it is uh, it's a very good tradition. Uh, that even senior monks, uh, uh, like me, uh, if, I, if I speak to a more senior monk, uh, it becomes natural uh, to, to, to put the hands together uh, in, out of respect, la, to show respect. La. So um, it's a very good practice la, uh, uh, to, uh, to humble yourself. La. But what Master Gotama is most helpful for paying respect? We ask Master Gotama about the thing most helpful for paying respect. Visiting is most helpful for paying respect, Bharat Bhaja. If one does not visit a teacher, one will not pay respect to him. But because one visits a teacher, one pays respect to him. That is why visiting is most helpful for paying respect. But what Master Gotama is most helpful for visiting? We ask Master Gotama about the thing most helpful for visiting. Faith is most helpful for visiting Bharat Vajra. If faith in the teacher does not arise, one will not visit him. But because faith in the teacher arises, one visits him. That is why faith is most helpful for visiting. We asked Master Gotama about the preservation of truth, and Master Gotama answered about the preservation of truth. We approve of and accept that answer, and so we are satisfied. We asked Master Gotama about the discovery of truth, and, the Master, and Master Gotama answered about the discovery of truth. We approve of and accept that answer, and so we are satisfied. We asked the Master Gotama about the final arrival at truth, and Master Gotama answered about the final arrival at truth. We approve of and accept that answer, and so we are satisfied. We asked Master Gotama about the thing most helpful for the final arrival at truth, and Master Gotama answered about the thing most helpful for the final arrival at truth. We approve of and accept that answer, and so we are satisfied. Whatever we ask Master Gotama about, that he has answered us. We approve of and accept that answer, and so we are satisfied. Formerly, Master Gotama, we used to think, who are these bald pater recluses, these swarthy menial offspring of the kinsman's feet, that they would understand the Dhamma? But Master Gotama has inspired in me love for recluses, confidence in recluses, reverence for recluses, magnificent Master Gotama, magnificent Master Gotama, etc. So he took refuge in the Buddha Dhamma and Sangha. From today, let Master Gotama remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge for life. That's the end of the sutta. So here you see uh, this arrogant uh, young Brahmin uh, come to argue with the Buddha. Finally, uh, he realized uh, that the Buddha is actually uh, uh, an Arahant Samasam Buddha. So he asked questions uh, to learn the Dhamma. Uh, so whatever he asked, the Buddha ans ans answered him uh, um, very clearly. Uh. So in the end, uh, he took refuge with the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha which means uh, that actually he changed his religion uh, from being uh, uh, one of the Brahmin religion, I uh, became the uh, Buddhist. Uh, so, you see, like the, all this teaching uh, the Buddha gave in front of hundreds of these Brahmins, uh, probably uh, most of them uh, would have taken refuge uh, with the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha and became followers of the Buddha. Uh, okay, we end here. Oh, very long to die very long. Mm. But this last sutta is very uh, very good. Uh, you see uh, how uh, if a person uh, wants to learn, uh, uh, the, all the steps uh, are laid out very clearly uh, by the Buddha. A lot of people, uh, we don't know all these things. Uh, uh, instead of uh, 
like uh, in, uh, like the Buddha says, when you come to a potential teacher, uh, you should investigate him, uh, whether he has greed, hatred and delusion. Uh. But a lot of people, instead of investigating the teacher, uh, they want to look for psychic power in the teacher, uh, whether the teacher got a big, big reputation and all these things. Uh. Uh, all this is not the way of the Dhamma. Uh. Okay, anything to uh, discuss? Yes, yes, the uh, foundation of the Dhamma must be there uh, before you can judge uh, whether the teacher is teaching uh, according to the Dhamma or not. Uh, and the Buddha says, uh, uh, if the teacher teaches according to the actual Dhamma of the Buddha, that means according to the uh, early Nikayas, uh, uh, then you can follow him, otherwise uh, you should not follow him. Uh. So if a person, what happens usually, uh, a lot of people who are new, uh, they don't know how to judge because they have no Dhamma foundation. They don't know how to judge and they are easily impressed by what other people say. Uh. People, other people say, oh, oh Liao Su Hu, uh, then they will, they, they will also accept uh, that oh, Liao Su Hu. Uh. So, oh, Liao Su Hu means uh, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a teacher with substance, la. somebody who is, uh, uh, is a great, la. Uh, great teacher and all this thing. Uh, so that's why uh, people who are new uh, always, uh, uh, they, 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 they get cheated la, in that way. Mm. How long one takes uh, to understand the Dhamma, it depends on uh, the person. Uh, just like how long does one take to attain jhana, it depends on the person. Uh, uh, what is important, the Buddha says, uh, is that to understand the Dhamma, we, should ha we need a clear mind, a mind devoid of the five hindrances. Uh, so, uh, samatha, meditation, uh, uh, that's why in the, in, in the Buddha's teachings uh, is the only real meditation. We meditate uh, to sharpen our mind. Uh, then uh, at the same time, we learn the Dhamma. Uh. These two things uh, are the uh, fundamentals uh, of the uh, spiritual path, uh, the theory and the practice. Uh. The theory is the uh, learning the original Dhamma of the Buddha according to the Nikayas, the Suttas. And the practice is the uh, sharpening the mind uh, by uh, meditation. Uh, these two go together uh, and uh, can be done simultaneously. Uh. So as your mind sharpens, uh, you will understand the Dhamma more clearly. Uh. Uh, so a person with a sharper mind, uh, for example, a person with a high IQ, uh, when he studies the suttas, uh, he will understand much faster uh, than a person uh, uh, with a low IQ. Uh. Some of them, uh, you actually, um, even though they learn wrong Dhamma, but they meditate. That's why you see like uh, earlier the Sutta um, on who this is Brahma Yu, I think this old 120 year old Brahmin uh, who came 
to the Buddha and then later and um, became a disciple of the Buddha and soon after that he passed away and the Buddha said uh, that he was reborn as an Anagamin which shows uh, that he had already attained the four jhanas uh, and so from there you can see uh, uh, why some of them are arrogant uh, because they have already attained certain states of meditation uh, so they think uh, they have already uh, seen the Dhamma uh, that is their Dhamma uh, so that's why some of them are quite arrogant uh, when they meet the Buddha uh, when the Buddha really uh, makes very plain uh, the Dhamma to them uh, then because they have a very clear mind uh, they can accept uh, and even like Sela uh, renounce uh, go forth uh, uh, as a Buddha is among disciples uh, so uh, it's unfortunate uh, that they learn the wrong Dhamma but uh, uh, those uh, who had the courage uh, and the uh, straightforwardness uh, to come and, and see the Buddha and question the Buddha uh, then they uh, became disciples of the Buddha uh. For somebody uh, to restrict himself to one Nikaya is only okay uh, if at the beginning uh, you study one Nikaya but all the time to restrict yourself to one Nikaya I think that's really silly uh. when there are four Nikayas available uh, why do you want to restrict yourself to uh, only one Nikaya because the Buddha taught so many suttas uh, for a purpose uh. the Buddha taught about 5,000 suttas uh, because when you explain the truth, uh, you can explain it from one angle or another angle or another angle. So the more suttas we study, the more we will understand. Uh, for example, Satipatthana. There are some people, uh, they just study the Satipatthana Sutta and they think they understand everything about Satipatthana. This is uh, not true at all uh, because if you study the Satipatthana Sangyutta where there are so many suttas explaining Satipatthana then you can understand it very much better. Uh, uh. So it's silly uh, to restrict yourself to one Nikaya. Also, uh, as I mentioned last night, uh, there are some teachers uh, who are very possessive uh, and uh, uh, they want to restrict their disciples uh, to only hear their words uh, and not to hear uh, the words of any other teacher or see the books of any other teacher. Uh, that also is, uh, 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 it just shows uh, that the ego uh, is there. Uh, if that person is humble, uh, he will know. Uh, that monks are not supposed to teach the Dhamma. Monks are supposed to teach the Buddha's Dhamma. We are all Sakya Putta, sons of the Sakyan. Uh, the Dhamma does not belong to us. This Dhamma is from the Samasam Buddha, Arahan Samasam Buddha. So it is our duty uh, to teach the Dhamma according to what the Buddha said, not according to our own opinion. Uh, so to 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 tell the disciple uh, there is only. Uh, uh, listen to his words uh, is, is, is just arrogance uh, uh, it is not his Dhamma and the Dhamma is the Buddha's Dhamma and the best uh, source of the Dhamma is the original four uh, Nikayas uh, and we know uh, that uh, the Pali uh, Suttas uh, the Pali Nikayas are the most accurate uh, uh, that we have uh, uh, even uh, uh, scholar like the famous uh, Professor Hirakawa, he says uh, that the Pali suttas have been preserved uh, intact uh, uh, from the time of Emperor Asoka until now. Uh, so the most accurate uh, uh, source of the Buddha's teachings uh, are in the four Pali Nikayas, uh, the Diga Nikaya, Majjima Nikaya, Sangyutta Nikaya and Anguttara Nikaya. Uh. Okay. Um, I understand that uh, one uh, a 
Want me to comment about this? Uh, huh? Or the before uh, a monk can be independent? Uh, uh, in the Vinaya books, uh, uh, Samanera has to stay with the teacher. Uh. Samanera is under probation, uh, so. A Samanera cannot uh, live by himself. La. And uh, a young monk also, la. a young monk uh, who does not have five vasa, is supposed to stay with the teacher for five years uh, to learn the Dhamma and the Vinaya and all the basic things. La. Uh, and um, after five years, uh, that monk uh, can be independent, uh, provided. Uh, he is knowledgeable about the Dhamma and the Vinaya. Uh, in the Vinaya books, uh, the Buddha said, uh, if, for example, a certain monk is uneducated, uh, and he, uh, he cannot read, uh, cannot read the, 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 the suttas uh, and the nikayas, uh, and then uh, and he stays with the teacher, uh, he does not learn enough of the suttas and the Vinaya, even after five years, uh, he cannot be independent. He has to stay uh, with the teacher until such time that he uh, is learned in the suttas and the vinaya. So if he is uneducated at all, uh, he cannot be independent by himself. All his life, uh, he has to stay with the teacher. Otherwise, uh, he might be teaching uh, others uh, what is not Dhamma. He might think that is Dhamma. Uh, uh, so... Uh, on the other hand, the, the Buddha says in the Vinaya books uh, that uh, somebody, after he comes into monkhood, uh, after he is uh, fully ordained, even if he does not have five years uh, as a monk, uh, uh, if he wants to strive, uh, meditate hard, uh, he is allowed to uh, stay alone. Uh. But preferably during the Vasa, he should stay with senior monks la, to learn. La. Other than that, uh, especially like for example, somebody has gone forth la, in the old age la, and he feels he does not have much time la, and he also has a good foundation in the Dhamma. For example, a lay person la, who has studied the Dhamma for many years la, and then he goes forth la, late in life. La, then la, it is allowable for him la, to, for example, go and live alone in a cave. La, and meditate la, and not mix with people. La. Mm. If a student, uh, a, 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 a monk disciple, uh, uh, he does not show enough respect and faith and all these things, uh, it, only, it only means uh, that he has not learned enough of the Dhamma and the Vinaya. La. So if he has not learned enough of the Dhamma and Vinaya, he should not become independent, uh, stay by himself. Uh, so... Um, also, he should not accept disciples la, later on, even if he has ten vasa, because uh, he has not learned enough. La. Uh, so if a person actually knows the Dhamma and Vinaya, he practice correctly, uh, uh, he should become very humble. La. He should become very humble and, and uh, uh, his uh, temper also should come down. La. Uh, Generally in the Vinaya, 
uh, four months is uh, enough time, uh, according to the Buddha, to judge a person uh, generally. Uh, but uh, that is only generally generally true. Uh, there are some people, uh, they hide uh, their, their character very well, uh, so you need longer period uh, uh, before their defilements show. Uh. Uh, in the Vinaya, when a disciple, uh, a monk disciple, uh, um, has certain uh, uh, faults, uh, for example, uh, not enough faith in the teacher, not enough respect in the teacher, not enough love for the teacher, uh, no sense of shame towards the teacher, uh, uh, then uh, the teacher, uh, according to the Vinaya, uh, should chase him away, uh, expel him. Uh, uh, so, uh, ask him to leave. Uh, uh, so, uh, when, that, when that new young monk leaves, uh, uh, he goes to another monastery. Uh, uh, such a monk uh, probably won't change his character. Uh, uh, you go to another monastery, it will be the same. La. So, in strict monasteries, uh, if a monk from somewhere else c comes to that monastery, uh, that strict monastery uh, will require a letter, a letter of recommendation uh, to sort of to certify that this particular monk is of good character. Uh, so, that is a good practice. La. Uh, so, there, of course, there are a lot of lax monasteries. Huh? They won't require a letter. Lah. So, in which case, as a rotten monks come in or so, huh? uh, they accept. Uh, so, it's a good practice lah, to ask for a letter huh, if some monk comes. Huh? Unless uh, uh, he is known huh, before. Lah, before huh? mm. Okay. Shall we end here? You think... Mm-hmm.